Welcome at this uh, second webinar. Uh, it's all under the flag of Ferments Academy. So this is uh, uh, the more educational part uh, in Fermentis, where we try to share, you know, all the things that we learn with you, uh, so you can take advantage of, of, uh, of, of what we know. So today, uh, uh, Emily, can you mute your uh, microphone, please? Ah, perfect. So now it's a bit, you can still hear me, I hope, guys. <clears throat> Just say yes, Emily, if you hear me. <laughs> oh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. So since we are with a lot of people, we cannot uh, allow everybody inside this room. Otherwise, it will be uh, a little bit uh, chaotic, a little bit noisy. Um, um, so we have some guidelines. Uh, first of all, I'm Gino. Uh, I introduced myself uh, quite extensively last week. So I will not do that today. I've been working for ferments for three years. Uh, I have a lot of expertise in, in cell metabolism uh, from yeast, but also from bacteria and diatoms actually. So uh, I'm an active home brewer. Uh, so I brew a lot myself on a small scale. So only 35 liters, but still I have a, quite a nice system. And today uh, we have the lovely Emily joining me as a moderator. So, Emily, if you can please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, so I'm Emily. I'm Marketing Coordinator at Charles Ferrum. Um, I've worked here since March, so just when lockdown started, um, which has been interesting. So I've been helping out while everybody's been furloughed um, and just helping keep things tick over. Thanks. So, uh, and the rest of you is, is, is you, obviously. Um, uh, we don't have time to, to, to ask you, all of you, to introduce yourselves. Sorry for that. So today, the presentation will be uh, around 40 minutes. Um, there's always room for questions. Um, we prefer to, to uh, if you ask them after uh, the webinar, uh, because it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's more convenient. Uh, um, but if you have an urgent question, uh, please use the chat function uh, and, and Emily reads this uh, while I'm presenting. And then if, if it's a, a really urgent question, uh, she can disturb me and, and, uh, and, and ask me uh, to, to read the chat and answer your question. So today uh, it's the second one uh, in the cycle. And today I'm going to talk about rehydration versus direct pitching of yeast, what is best. Um, and in the in the follow up, so this is kind of build up in a in a kind of lo logical way. So we will go more and more into the into the deep in, in terms of knowledge and uh, and and uh, and know how uh, about brewing and fermentation. Uh, but today is is a bit. This is to be honest, a bit uh, an older story, but it it fits quite nicely in 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 the lineup. So. Before I start, I'll very shortly introduce uh, Fermentis. Fermentis is a business unit of Le Safre. Le Safre is quite a big company, as you learned last week. Um, we are based in Lille, so the headquarters is in Lille. Uh, this is a very nice city uh, with a fantastic beer lineup, actually. And they have all the Belgian beers also available, but also the new uh, beers brewed in France, which are actually getting quite good not up to the level uh, still uh, as uh, you guys make in the uk uh, but but they are are, are you know reaching a quite nice uh, level of of quality uh, already uh, bear in mind in france uh, it has always been wine and champagne um, but now brewing is, is really picking up our factory is based in Ghent, which is around 40 minutes drive uh, from, from Lille, so quite close by. And I explained last week uh, all about this factory, so I'll not do that today. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we are a business unit of La Safra, and we uh, mainly focus on uh, the world of fermented beverages. So everything that has alcohol in it and is drinkable, uh, we work on that. Uh, so. Main, mainly on beer, wine, uh, cider, and spirits, but also uh, other, you know, drinkable alcohol uh, with, with with specific products. So the main uh, products uh, uh, are yeasts, of course, 
but we also have bacteria and, and yeast uh, derivatives, different ones. These two will be discussed uh, in a later webinar. Um, so today the focus will be on yeast. So what is yeast? Yeast is a sexual organism, and I will show a short example of that later on. To also to keep you guys a little bit awake, you know, if you talk about sex, a lot of people stay awake. Um, it's a small organism, four to eight micrometers, and it belongs uh, to the the clade of the fungus. If you look into the tree of life, um, in nature there are about uh, two hundred thousand species present. Uh, the most uh, relevant ones industrially uh, are, 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 are a lot less, say a few hundred, a few thousand. Um, to be honest, uh, it's, it could be like a few thousand if you include, uh, you know, all the applications in food. Uh, but if you if you look strictly to uh, to, to beer, it, it's like you know maybe a hundred, hundred fifty strains are are available. And in later webinars, you will learn, uh, you know, if you need all those uh, th those different strains or not. So for brewing, we have two uh, classic strains, uh, the Saccharomyces pastorianus, which is uh, the bottom fermenting of the lager yeast. It prefers somewhat cold condition, and that's, for, that's why the fermentations are normally running a lot slower. Now we have the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a top fermenting yeast. Um, uh, it likes warm conditions, and that's why these fermentations uh, are going a lot faster. So uh, these two uh, are the main species for brewing, and I'll, I'll uh, highlight a little bit more the Saccharomyces pastorianus because this yeast actually originated from a, a great sexual event, maybe like a hundred years ago, 150 years ago. Um, because the Saccharomyces pastorianus is actually a, a yeast hybrid. It's a cross between two different species, a Saccharomyces cerevisiae and a Saccharomyces eubayanus. And this has actually only been discovered uh, quite recently, uh, in 2011, by a guy called uh, Diego Lipkind, who was uh, running around in Patagonia and sampling uh, yeast from nature, actually. Um, I don't know why. Why he was in Patagonia, but uh, anyway, he uh, he isolated this yeast, the Saccharomyces eubayanus. And what you do as a scientist uh, nowadays, if you find the yeast, uh, you sequence the genome, and then you blast it. Uh, you can do that online. Uh, everybody can do that actually, and and to see if you find any similarities genetically with other yeasts. And he found a lot of uh, similarities with the Saccharomyces pastorianus. Actually, he found out that about half of the genome was 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 completely similar to the to the genome or, or half of the genome of the Eubayanus. Looking a bit further, he concluded that uh, the other part that was present in the genome uh, was originating from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So he concluded, based in, in on on his work, that the Saccharomyces pastorianus. Uh, is a result of this, uh, you know, sexual event that that happened. Um, where it happened, there's still a lot of debate on that, and because uh, they they first said, okay, it's probably somewhere northern Europe, uh, it's probably Germany, maybe Holland, and uh, maybe the UK even. Um, uh, but then, like in the in the period when this was published, uh, you know, also the the Chinese said no. Uh, the first uh, lager yeast was originated in. Uh, in China, uh, and then we have people from the US saying, no, no, the first one originated in the US. It's not really relevant. Uh, it is something special. And to to highlight a, a little bit uh, this, this special aspect, I, I looked up some examples uh, from other hybrids, uh, uh, from other domains of life. And these are shown on this picture. So on the left, uh, we have peppermint, uh, which is actually a cross between watermint and spearmint. So also two different species. And that uh, gave life to this uh, this species peppermint, which is now actually dominating uh, the planet. So it, uh, it, there's a lot more peppermint uh, around in the world than watermint and spearmint, and that's because peppermint, so the offspring of these two parents, is a lot stronger um, and grows a lot faster uh, than the parents. And the second example is the liger which is a cross between a lion and a tiger. Uh, you don't find them uh, in nature, actually. This one is in a zoo. So I don't know exactly what happened in the zoo. This is a, this is a zoo in Germany. 
Um, so obviously uh, they were together for some time and uh, and created this uh, this very unique species. Um, so this is not occurring in nature, but it's just to indicate that it's possible to cross, you know, two different species and end up with a with a with a new species. And last but not least, the wolf fin, which is a, a cross between a false killer whale and, and a dolphin. So also not sure where this this happened because this was taken from uh, from some uh, how do you call that dolphinarium. Uh, uh, uh so, so like a, a an event place where they uh, they they do tricks with uh, with with dolphins um so obviously this this is most likely also not uh, not not uh, happened this also not happened in in nature but but uh, somewhere in indoors in a contained uh, area so now if if you if you receive you know customers in your tap room uh, and you are serving your uh, your lager beer, you at least have a story to tell. It involves sex and it involves some science. So it could interest your uh, uh, your customers. So let's continue and get to the story. Uh, at Fermentis, uh, we have 15 dry yeasts for brewing. So we have three lager yeasts, so three of the special ones, and 12 ale yeasts. Uh, I will discuss uh, uh, the majority today in, in this experiment. I will show results. Uh, others will be discussed in, in, in separate webinars. Uh, we also have one bacteria at the moment on the market for cattle souring. And we have one functional product, uh, Spring Blanche, which you can add to beer to create and maintain permanent haze. Uh, there will also be a webinar on this at a later phase. And we have obviously also fermentation aids for, uh, for the guys that uh, make cider and, and other um, drinks based on... Uh, on uh, 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 you know, a substrate with, which has not a lot of nitrogen uh, inside. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, 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 simply the, the brewing process uh, and, uh, and looking at the metabolism, what happens. So as brewer, you start with, uh, with your malt bill, uh, you do your mashing. So you let uh, the enzymes uh, do the job and create uh, from the starch present in the malt fermentable sugars. This is a, like a general uh, composition that you find back in, in Word. Uh, so 10 to 15% glucose, 50 to 60% maltose, 10 to 20% maltotriose, and 50 to 20% dextrins, so the higher sugars. Obviously, you can control the composition uh, by changing the mashing scheme also a little bit by changing the malt bill, but mainly the mashing scheme. So uh, if you apply a high glucose mashing scheme, so the maltase scheme, you can end up with like, like say 30% of glucose. Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, apply a, a mashing scheme that is targeted to, for a lot of residual sugars, uh, you, you increase temperature very fast and you end up uh, with, with a lot of uh, maltotriose and dextrins uh, left in the, uh, uh, in the word, so these are, are uh, uh, unfermentable sugars. That said, uh, if you have the sugars, you add the yeast and you start fermenting, and the most two Im most important compounds that are produced are ethanol and CO2. So the majority uh, of, of the carbon that is present here is going into ethanol and CO2 in a one-to-one -one ratio. But also some other products are produced, glycerol, which brings in the mouthfeel uh, of, of the beer and also some body. Uh, you produce uh, some acids. Uh, this is specific uh, for, for each yeast. So you can have uh, some that produce a little bit of acetic acid, succinic acid. It's all not that much. Obviously, you also produce biomass. So uh, from all the sugar that you put, put in, around 5% ends up into, into biomass, so into new yeast cells. And then you produce also uh, the, the most interesting part are the aromas and the flavors. And as I mentioned, some sugars cannot be fermented, so they also end up in your beer. Looking a little bit uh, to this flavor metabolism, I will, I will be very sure, brief uh, today. Uh, so you start with sugar, it enters the cell, and you have a lot of metabolic reactions uh, taking place, uh, leading uh, to you know, final products. Ethanol is the most important one because it's the highest in concentration. But you also produce a lot of nice esters. Um, two of them I want to highlight, isoamyl acetate and ethyl acetate. So the fruity uh, banana flavor in beer and the, the, the fruity solvent flavor in beer. 
uh, reason I mentioned these is because these two are produced uh, by all the yeast. So every yeast in the world produces these two compounds. Uh, maybe in a later webinar I, I can explain why, but uh, for today I will not. Uh, obviously, for every yeast, the concentration of these compounds is different. That's why a lager is more neutral than a typical fruity ale yeast that produces a lot of uh, a lot more of this of this stuff. All flavors also present, uh, and the sulfury notes, diacetyl, buttery notes, uh, green apple notes. Sometimes it, it's, they are desired, sometimes not. But I will uh, come back to that in the, in the next webinar, actually. Uh, which is more looking at, at flavor. So to make a little bit of sense of the soup of options, uh, um, uh, we, uh, we came up with the idea to, uh, to uh, ferment all the yeast that we have in our portfolio under the same conditions. So 15 plato wort, a, a simple uh, uh, pilsen malt, uh, 25 IBU bitterness using iso alpha extract, so no hop addition to have no impact from, uh, from hop flavors. We pitched all the, the yeast at 50 gram per hectoliter and fermented all at 23 degrees Celsius. And then we came up with this quite simple uh, representation of, uh, of flavors, so neutral, fruity, and spicy, these three axes. And then based on the sensory characteristics of the beers, we positioned uh, uh, the yeast according to, uh, uh, to the results. So if you want to, for instance, brew uh, uh, an IPA, you don't want to have a lot of uh, contributions from yeast flavors, uh, then you look at the neutral axis and you can use and select, for instance, USO5. If you want to brew a, a nice fruity blonde, you can look at the fruity axis and, and select one of these. If you want to brew something uh, that has a little bit more spiciness in it, you can uh, select one of these. So this is simply a, a starting point. Uh, as you will learn next week, these can move around as soon as you change conditions. So this is only relevant for the, for the conditions stated here. But at least it gives you some starting point. Because if you have uh, a fruity yeast, it will always be fruity. Uh, but the level of fruitiness can, can vary if you change the conditions. But in the end, uh, fruitiness is a, is, a, is a character. And it will always uh, remain in the yeast. It's very hard uh, under the normal conditions to, uh, to remove uh, you know, typical uh, uh, characters uh, from a yeast. So uh, a fruity yeast will always be or, 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 or have some remaining fruitiness no matter what you do. So in the brewery, uh, I'm getting there now uh, to, to the real story, actually. Um, I will skip the first part because you all know it. Um, we end up in the fermentation and there uh, for the lager yeast, uh, you, you pitch normally uh, around 80 to 120 grams per hectoliter. Uh, you can also go above and below, but more on that next week. And for ale yeast, uh, you pitch around 50 to 80 grams per hectoliter uh, to reach uh, a, a, a cell number of around 4 million cells per milliliter at the start. Um, and then we have uh, also bottle refermentation. Uh, uh, the option I, I don't think it's it's used a lot in in the UK. It's uh, maybe ten breweries or maybe fifteen breweries are using uh, refermentation, which is quite sad because it's the best option to preserve your beer. But anyway, um, we have a special yeast for that. I will not go into detail uh, and go to the next one. Uh, so. What we always recommended and what has been recommended for, for many, many years is before pitching the yeast in the tank, you rehydrate it. And the procedure is as follows. So for lagers, you are at uh, around room temperature. You have uh, a volume of water, which is normally 10 times the volume of, of, of the yeast or 10 times the weight and volume of the yeast that you pitch. So if you pitch one kilo, you have 10 liters of water. Uh, you pitch it, you stir it a little bit, and then you let it stand for uh, for a certain time. So uh, the standard is 30 minutes. You can go a little bit beyond if you change the temperature. Uh, so if you lower the temperature, you can wait longer before pitching. If you increase the temperature, you, you have to be faster before pitching. So once this is completed, once the yeast has been rehydrated, you pitch it uh, into the tank and the fermentation starts. 
Alternatively, you can also pitch the yeast directly in the tank. And I'm not sure what you guys are doing, but when this, this uh, research originated, actually uh, it was because of, of feedback we got from, uh, from the market, because it was around 50-50, uh, like say five years ago, 50% uh, was rehydrating, the other 50% was always throwing it in directly, especially craft brewers. They like uh, to keep things simple, so they pitch it in and they also, uh, craft brewers are typically also more uh, innovative, more creative and uh, have a little bit more guts to change, you know, things uh, uh, from, from, from the past. So we got questions, obviously, you know, what is best? Uh, what should we do? And uh, so we decided to, to really investigate this. And the first, so I have two uh, parts. The first will focus on, on yeast cell viability and the second part on, on vitality. So what is the impact of rehydration on yeast cell viability? And first, I'll explain quickly what is cell viability. Well, cell vi viability says something about the, the percentage of cells that is living uh, if you pitch uh, the yeast, so it's it, 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 it's a, an indication of, of, of the, the amount of living cells, which basically means uh, the difference between life and, and death. So what we did, uh, these are the conditions that we tested. So I will not show all the strains because we did it for all the strains. I, 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 I selected a few of them. So we did, uh, I'll show results for S33, USO5, and T58. And for the lagers, S23, S189, and W3470. We use different rehydration times, so 15, 25, 35, 45 minutes. And then different agitation conditions. So we did it without agitation, just sprinkle the yeast on the liquid and wait. We did some moderate agitation. Um, uh, so this was always advised. You sprinkle the yeast, you stir a bit. Uh, and then you wait. And we also did the vigorous agitation. So really uh, sprinkled the yeast and then uh, shaked uh, the bottles uh, every two minutes. So this, this is uh, basically no stress, a lot of stress for the yeast. Now we looked at different temperatures. So we did at 8, 12, 16, 20, 32, and 40 degrees. And we used different media. And so distilled water, mineral water, tap water. 7% ethanol, word at 7 Plato, word at 15 Plato, and word at 25 Plato. And then under the conditions, we measured the viability by uh, the Treffer Blue Exclusion Test. Uh, and with this test, you can see uh, simply by coloring uh, the cells, uh, which ones are al alive, which ones are dead. And with that, you can calculate uh, the viability. So let's go to the results. First results, I, I'm showing the, the, the impact of temperature and agitation on, on viability for the ales. So uh, here the top left corner, this graph, uh, temperature on the x-axis, viability on the y-axis. And it's important to compare the, the height of the, the different bars. So the blue bars are uh, the experiments without agitation, the red bars with the moderate agitation and the green bars with the vigorous agitation. So if you compare that for the different temperatures for T58, you see no significant difference. So it works uh, uh, if you don't uh, agitate. So if you, you know, have the less stressful condition, you see it works in, in the complete temperature range. Then for the moderate agitation, you see a, a little bit of a decrease uh, at the lower temperatures. Uh, at the higher temperatures, you don't see this. Uh, you can explain this, uh, you know, decrease uh, with increasing stress level at lower temperatures because it's an ale yeast. It doesn't like low temperatures. So uh, it's a combination of results of the lower temperature and, and, and the, 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 the more stressful situation because of the agitation that you lose some of the viability. It's still not much. You're still uh, around 90%, which is uh, it, it's more than enough to start up uh, a fermentation. And in the green situation, vigorous, you, you lose a little bit more. Uh, for T58, not that much. Uh, T58 is a very strong, robust yeast. Uh, you will see in others that, uh, uh, that it has a bit more impact, like uh, the USO5. If you don't uh, uh, put any stress, so if you don't agitate, you see you have a nice viability uh, over the full temperature range, not at 40 degrees. So. 
Apparently, USO5 doesn't like this temperature. It's simply too high. But it, at low temperature, it also is doing quite well. But then if you start uh, uh, agitating, uh, you see the drop in viability. So at vigorous agitation, you see uh, you know, a drop of around uh, 30% uh, in viability, which means that uh, you know, the most favorable situation for USO5 would be without agitation. Then S33, very similar result. Uh, so I, I think I don't have to explain it. Uh, in the end, we concluded for the ales, you know, without agitation and at somewhat higher temperature uh, are the best conditions uh, for rehydration. Because you end up with the highest uh, viability. Now let's look at large. I'm showing two now, the S23 and the S189. Um, again, viability versus temperature and then the, the, the different uh, uh, regimes. So as you can see, uh, uh, if you don't agitate at all, so the least stressful condition, uh, the, the viability is the same over a wide range of temperatures. Uh, you lose a little bit at higher temperature. Again, this is logical because S23 is a lager yeast. It prefers lower temperatures. So a higher temperature is more stressful for a lager than, than the lower temperature. We find something very similar for the S189. So the best conditions uh, are the least stressful conditions. So without agitation, the, the, I, I, I conclude here also moderate agitation. And the reason is because in some cases, the differences are not really significant. And you can see here and here, it's all the same. Then uh, look at the impact of rehydration time. Um, first for the ales here on the left side. So here uh, on the x-axis, we have the time of rehydration in minutes and on the y-axis, the viability. Uh, again, important to, uh, to compare uh, the height of the bars. So uh, not the starting point. It's not really relevant because we are comparing in the same experiment, uh, uh, simply uh, the, the start from the same starting situation. So and that's why uh, for, for, it's for the USO5 here shown in red, it had a little bit of a lower viability at the start, but we don't care because we compare it uh, at different times. And if we don't see a shift in the height of the bars, uh, it means it's all the same. So, uh, as you can see, uh, it's already done in 15 minutes for the ales. And for the lagers, we find something very similar. So it might be even faster than 50 minutes. Uh, we don't know. The lowest uh, time we, we, we tried was 15 minutes. Um, and we see that, that already then the yeast is completely rehydrated and has, a, and has a, the high uh, viability. It also shows that if you, know, if you want to do it a little bit longer, it's also fine. Uh, so it, it gives you a little bit of flexi flexibility uh, in timing. And you don't have to be really accurate if, you, if you're rehydrating in terms of time. So then looking at the rehydration medium, first I'll show the, the different uh, water styles of water we use. So we use distilled water, mineral water, and tap water. You might wonder why mineral water, um, because we uh, we got from the market that that some brewers are actually using uh, mineral water uh, because they think it's a, it's a better quality, or um, and f and furthermore they think it's sterile. Uh, actually, it's not. So be careful if you use mineral water. You still have to boil it before you use it to ensure, you know, that everything in there is 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 dead. You have no living organisms. The concentrations are very low, but still it's possible. So you don't want to introduce, you know, any contaminants in your process. So make sure to always boil. Um, looking at results here for three, uh, three strains. So T58, S23, which is the lager and USO5. If we look at the viability, uh, you see for the, for the different uh, uh, waters, there is no significant difference. So uh, I know the quality of water in the UK is not the best quality in the world. Uh, reason is I, I go to Scandinavia a lot and there they have fantastic water. In Holland also they have uh, very good water. In, uh, in the UK it's, it has quite a high chlorine uh, concentration. 
So I'm not sure uh, if I would go for tap water in, in, in your case, and maybe you could consider some water treatment to, to remove some of the, the chlorine, uh, at least for neutral beers. But anyway, if you decide to use tap water, it will also work in the UK for sure. Then uh, we looked uh, uh, on the impact uh, of, of rehydration if you do it in Word. So we did that at two temperatures at 7 degrees and 20 degrees. The first bar here is water, then it's a word of 7 Plato, pitched in word of 15 Plato, pitched in word of 25 Plato, uh, and this at 7 degrees. And in this case, I don't know why they changed the colors, but the first bar is water, again, word of 7, seven Plato, word 15 Plato, word 25 Plato. And as you can see, and this, this was a little bit of a surprise for us, uh, it seems to go a little bit better uh, when there's sugar available for the yeast. It, it seems to, to improve the viability uh, uh, at least a little bit. Um, we were not expecting that, uh, in particular if you look at the curve, it's going up, so the more sugar available, the better it seems uh, to work. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about you know these last differences, because I, I don't know if, if a yeast can sense a difference between 50 and a 25 Plato word, could be. Um, but take home message is here that it seems uh, like if there's there's uh, sugar available, uh, it's it, it, it's it's beneficial for your viability. There is some explanation uh, because uh, you can imagine if you have a dry yeast which uh, you know is sitting in a pack and there's nothing there, it's it's on the vacuum and you open it and you put it in water, so it will rehydrate. But, but what else can can the yeast do? virtually nothing, it's just sitting there. There's no food available. Um, so if you pitch it in words, uh, you have the same procedure, but then the yeast, you know, it, you, you throw it into paradise. There's all the nutrients available. And I think that's why it's uh, it's working a little bit better uh, at, at uh, as soon as there's uh, sugar present, because it's just simply entering a, a, a perfect environment, a more perfect environment than water, at least. So conclusions on uh, cell viability, uh, agi met agitation method has the highest impact. So it's best to, uh, to, to keep the stress as, as, uh, as low as possible, no or moderate agitation. We still mention moderate agitation. And the reason is if you have a, a dosing tank, so if you, if you need to pitch a lot of yeast and you just, uh, simply sprinkle it on top, uh, sometimes you end up with a pile of, of uh, a small mountain uh, of yeast on the liquid surface. And this is something uh, obviously that you don't want. It will take uh, a longer time for the yeast to settle. You might end up with a little bit of clumps. So these bigger tanks are often uh, a little bit agitated. Um, if you have a tank like that, uh, really look carefully uh, to the impeller. So uh, preferably use a, a marine type impeller. So, you know, like a, the screw on a boat instead of these, uh, these turbines. So the, the one with the flat blades, because the flat blade impellers, uh, they, they, they cause a lot of stress. They are, they are actually designed to, uh, to enforce a, a stressful situation. While the, the marine impellers are, are more focused on, uh, on mixing. Um, uh, instead of uh, putting in uh, a lot of uh, a lot of energy and a lot of stress. Next temperature, well, we saw it doesn't really uh, significantly impact uh, 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 the process type of media, and we also saw that it doesn't significantly impact. But uh, we saw uh, a clear trend that as soon as there's a little bit of sugar available, that it seems to uh, be beneficial for for viability. Uh, we did not see differences in terms of rehydration time, so it's a nice fast process. And the conclusions are similar for ale and lager yeasts. But what about the vitality? So what is vitality? Uh, and I'm trying to explain that by these two pictures. So here you have the Bundys. I think you also had this show in, in the UK uh, in the past. So this is about a family. And uh, the, the general uh, agreement with, with, between these people is that they are all quite lazy people. Uh, they're sitting on the couch and have a very low energy level. 
but they are alive. So the viability of the people and even the dog is 100% here. And then if you look at these people, and these are these guys and, and girls are running the marathon. So obviously they, they have a completely different energy state than, than these guys. So this is what vitality is. It says something about high vital in your yeast is, is if you have, if you pitch a yeast in fermentation, it starts very slowly and you have a, you have a lazy guy and you have a lazy yeast and it, 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 it starts up slowly. If you have the same yeast and, and, and prepare it uh, for, for fermentation in better conditions, you can have a fast yeast. So, so uh, that's cell vitality. So let's go into the background of the experiments uh, the conditions that we tested. So I'll show again three uh, ale and three lager yeasts. Uh, and as I mentioned, we did it for all the yeasts. So first conditions, no rehydration. So direct uh, pitch in worth. Um, this is designated as DP. And later on, rehydration in water. Uh, uh, it's designated as W. And rehydration uh, uh, in worth. Uh, of 15 Plato, that's how uh, I indicated later. Um, ales were pitched at 50 gram per hectoliter, 15 Plato, and, and uh, fermentation at 20 degrees. Uh, the lager strains pitched at 100 gram per hectoliter, uh, 15 Plato worth, and fermentation at 40 degrees. So let's look at the first result. Uh, oh, before uh, I, I go to the results, what we also did actually is. Um, we compared fresh versus aged active dry yeast uh, for the ones that were uh, last week. Uh, we we do a, a so-called forced aging test, which is a test um, uh, that allows you to 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 uh, to create uh, uh, an equivalent of three years of aging, but then in a faster way. So what you do is you you basically cycle the yeast uh, 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 for different times. Uh, in different situations, so high temperature, low temperature, uh, for, for different times to reach this uh, equivalency of, of three years of, of natural aging. So this is just a fast uh, technique. So we also compared uh, these kinetics. And then uh, for the final, so at, at, in the final phase, uh, we also looked at, uh, at, at uh, obviously, the, the aromatic profile. Uh, and I will show also the, the kinetics. Uh, everything was done in triplicate. Um, so uh, the results are, are quite uh, accurate. So let's look at the results first for the S33. Here in the top left, uh, you have a, a, a typical uh, a kinetics curve. So time, and in this case, versus ethanol concentration. Uh, as you can see, uh, you have, it, it all, almost looks like one curve, but it is where the blue line is the direct pitch, the orange line is the rehydration in water, and the gray line is the rehydration in 15 plate of word. And as you can see, we find no difference at all. This is exactly the same. If you look at final ethanol concentration, so here we also see it's exactly the same. So all end up at 5.4. And this also results obviously in the same apparent degree of fermentation, which is around 68%. Uh, for uh, for 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 this uh, for this yeast in these conditions, and then finally we also looked at the volatiles, uh, so the VDKs, the, the off flavors uh, like diacetyl, uh, the higher alcohols, the esters and the acetaldehyde. So again, if you compare the height of the bars, uh, uh, for instance, for the higher alcohols, you see that we didn't find any significant difference for the three different conditions. Similar for the VDKs similar for the acetaldehyde, similar for the esters. So for S33, we did not find any difference, which means that you can choose to rehydrate or direct pitch if you like. Then look at T58. I'm going to warn you because a lot of slides will look exactly the same as, as the one I just showed. As you can see again, the kinetics, completely the same and you see a little bit of a bump here but this is normal biological variation uh, overall it's 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 all the same for all the three conditions so there's no difference between direct pitch uh, uh, rehydration in water and rehydration in wort if you look at the fermentation kinet kinetics afterwards 
also uh, uh, final ABV. This is all uh, the same. It's uh, there's no significant difference. And apparent degree of fermentation is the same. And as you can see, also the aroma profile was the same in the case of T58. So it's already two strains that shows uh, there's no impact. What about USO5? I can be quite brief, uh, as you can see. Uh, and, you know, with, with one look at this slide, there is no difference uh, between the conditions. If you look at uh, the different parameters I just discussed. So what about uh, aging? Uh, so fresh yeast that was uh, collected immediately after production and then, uh, you know, the, a pack from the same production uh, was put uh, in the forced aging test. So aged for three years. And then if we compare the kinetics, uh, you see uh, there's no difference. Uh, you, you see a little bit of, uh, like for in, the, in the case of rehydration water, that it's a little bit behind, but the, the, the form of the curve is, is exactly the same. And this, these differences, you know, it's, it, they can all be related to simple biological variation. And you also see that um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the situation when the, the bad yeast has been aged for three years. So after five days of fermentation, you reach the end. And also, you know, uh, after five days, uh, you reach the end in the case where you use uh, a yeast that's three years. Which is nice because it means, you know, as I also showed last week, uh, uh, that there will there is no difference, and we 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 confirmed this again in this experiment uh, between uh, for, you know yeast that has a, a best before date of three years and and yeast that has you know reached the best before date. Then lagers. What about the lagers? Uh, and lagers are a bit more uh, a bit harder to produce, um, and they are a bit more sensitive. Um, so I'm showing here the W3470, uh, blue line again, direct pitch, orange uh, rehydration water, and gray rehydration 15 plate to word. Uh, look at the kinetics. <clears throat> you see no differences. Ethanol, final ABV, no differences, no difference in apparent uh, degree of fermentation. And then if you look at the volatiles, uh, you see if you compare the bars, no differences here, here, and here. For the VDKs, the higher alcohols, the acetaldehyde, and the esters. So also for the lagers, and we find that no matter how you do it, if you pitch directly or if you rehydrate, you will end up with the same beer. And the beer with the same aromatic profile. We find the same for S23. So it's a bit boring. Sorry for that, guys, but you know these are actual results. And also, if you don't see any difference, it is actually a, a good result. Forced uh, aging, uh, so fresh versus aged uh, for, for lager. I'm showing S23 here. And you see, again, uh, that there's no difference. So fermentation after uh, three years of aging is done uh, after eight days. And also, in the case of the fresh situation, you have it's done after eight days. So also there, there's no, no difference. So in conclusion, on cell vitality, we find no significant differences between direct pitch, rehydration in water, or rehydration in word. If you look at kinetics, a flavor profile, a final ABV, and a apparent degree of fermentation, which brought us and actually our marketing department to the conclusion that we have to brand this so this is a marketing slide uh, sorry guys um, we have a brand a call it's called easy to use and if you see this on the label uh, on the package of as a label on the, on, on a package of yeast then you know that we did this these experiments i just showed today uh, to ensure that it we we we, uh, we we research actually if there's a difference between direct pitching, rehydration in water or rehydration in wort. Uh, we looked at uh, cell viability and cell vitality, and if we didn't find any differences, you get uh, this label uh, on on the pack. And as you will notice, most of our yeasts uh, are easy to use. So. Uh, uh, we did it for almost all yeasts. We, we still have some in our portfolio that are not. Um, like, for instance, the one I mentioned before, Saf Ale F2, which is the yeast for bottle refermentation. 
Um, uh, and the reason is that this yeast is not pitched in wort nor in water, it's pitched in beer, which makes it uh, the situation far more complex because, uh, as you all know, there are thousands of different uh, beers available, um, multiple styles, so it's, it's kind of hard uh, to, to study that. Uh, maybe we'll do that in the future, but for now, uh, we didn't, so uh, we still recommend uh, to do it the old school way uh, in terms of F2 and simply rehydrate it. In my own home brewery, uh, to be uh, to be honest, I, I don't do it. I just throw it in the tank and it works. But uh, I mean, th this is not real true science. It's it's uh, the science at home. Last but not least, and we reach the end. I like to indicate again that we have a, a great app with a lot of tools and a lot of information available. Uh, if you uh, uh, if you want to uh, to download it, it's free. Uh, you can find it uh, both uh, on Android and in the App Store. Just uh, just search for Fermentus and you will find it. Um, next week I will show uh, really the you know some beneficial aspects like data, which is also in the app and can sometimes help you uh, in in decision making on on your fermentation process. And with that, I just like to indicate the next webinar, which is. Uh, not next week, but the week after, um, same time. And then we're gonna discuss uh, uh, the impact of fermentation conditions on the flavor profile of beer. Uh, this is a very extensive study, very detailed. So I highly recommend that you, uh, that you, uh, that you join. Um, uh, it's a very interesting one. And then uh, the others uh, I'll discuss next week. Last but not least, uh, I would really appreciate if you uh, if you complete a very short, it takes two minutes, uh, questionnaire. Uh, leave your comments, leave your suggestions, and also, uh, you know, if you have specific topics that you want me to discuss in the future, you know, just put it in there, and I will prepare and and, and make uh, new webinars. Especially consider the situation that we are in; we don't know how long it will take. Uh, you know, when we can uh, go back to normal. So this is the only way. Uh, for me actually to talk to you guys uh, and, and share information so thanks for that and i think now we have time for questions yeah i think you've got one question in the in the chat box that's just come in as you were okay so finished. from from david if initial rehydration mm -hmm. has no material benefit why is suggested on the package to use rehydration um, because uh, some brewers still prefer to rehydrate so i just showed that it did that there's there is no difference uh, um, um, why they didn't change the package yet i to be honest i don't know uh, it's a uh, it, it, fermentus is part of a big company and to make changes like that and to to, to give you a, a, a great example uh, if you have uh, uh, like a, a packet of BE134, for instance, of WBO6, there are also sometimes mistakes even on the package. So in case of the BE134, it says, okay, this is a, a highly attenuating yeast. Uh, uh, the, the, the fermentation uh, uh, will end up, <clears throat> the gravity of fermentation will end up high, which actually it should be low. Um, but this is what happens uh, sometimes and before you know this change is is transferred on the market uh, as i explained last week we uh, we put uh, you know quite big quantities uh, on the market at the same time so if we produce a yeast uh, you have to think in numbers like seven tons eight tons at a time so if there is a mistake on the packaging uh, it will circulate for many years uh, so if we even if we make a change, it will take years before uh, uh, before it, it's a, it, it has changed all over the market. Does that answer your question, David? And apologies for not uh, watching in the camera all the time, but I ha I work on two screens, so it, this looks a bit strange. Uh, so, so sorry for that. So we have a new question uh, from from Dave. Is there a major difference between yeast pitching temperature and uh, word temperature, say yeast at room temperature and word at 12 degrees? 
um, could be, uh, to be honest. Uh, when I uh, I started fermentation myself, I, I always take out the yeast from the fridge uh, to uh, to warm it up, basically already in the pack. Uh, so it's already at room temperature uh, when I pitched it. Um, maybe if you if you take it directly from from a refrigerator so say even at four degrees and you pitch it um i i don't think it has a, a massive impact to be honest because um uh i mean the yeast is is in in silent mode anyway in in, in the refrigerator and then if you put it in uh, in wort or in, in in warm water uh it simply starts so i i don't think that's a, that's a big issue Then David has a new question. Previous research has shown that a, uh, that a faster is by rehydration, and this reduces the stress on the yeast, and more yeast suffice. Should uh, say faster uptake of water. Well, I think I just showed that we didn't find any difference. <laughs> so uh, uh, if you know where I can find this previous research, this is done uh, with, with our yeast. Um, so we didn't find it, 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 it's still, you know, it's still valid and, and, and okay to, to rehydrate if, if that is something that you prefer. Uh, it's, it's, we simply show that there's no difference in, in the flavor profile of the beer that you produce. So does that answer your question, David? And thank you, John. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. Cheers. <laughs> So Dave and, and David are typing. And also Nick. Yeah, you do that, David. Research a little bit more. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. Well, Emily, I think uh, we reached the end. There are no more questions. Oh, still one oh. <laughs> from Dave. In the brewery, I've used a lower pitching volume of yeast than instructions for, say, homebrewers yeast. Yeah, and you found that it works. <laughs> so... Um, Yes, it seems to make no difference. Yeah, thanks <laughs> for the confirmation. Uh, so to explain a little bit, um, uh, what we recommend on specification sheets uh, in our tips and tricks uh, and on, on, on several other information brochures are conditions that we are very 100% sure that work. So obviously, and that you will see that in two weeks in the webinar, uh, you as as the creators, as the brewers, uh, you know, can way can go way beyond uh, uh, our recommendations. Um, but if you are a starting brewer uh, and you don't know what to do, then you need some direction. You need some some guidance, uh, you know, to to ensure that you are at least producing something um, uh, that will be uh, that will be good and that you like. Because you know you can you can compare it if you if you if you are cooking a dish an extensive dish a nice meal, and uh, you were standing in the kitchen for for, uh, for for I don't know three four hours, and then if you taste it uh, and and it's not a nice dish, it's it's not very rewarding. With brewing, it's even worse because it takes way longer than than three hours in the kitchen, and it takes you like three weeks in the kitchen. So uh, if you if you start out as a brewer and, and you produce your first beer and it tastes like shit, you know, when you taste it, um, 
uh, this is not very rewarding. So that's why uh, we, we come up with, with, uh, with advice, with recommendations uh, that we know uh, will work. Um, so in terms of rehydration, I, I also know that uh, that's a larger breweries, you know, who have dosing tanks also not uh, are not looking at 10 times the volume. They just look at the volume of the tank and then they calculate how much yeast they need. And sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. So for sure, uh, this is working. Um, and it's cheaper too. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, next uh, next webinar you will see the impact of of pitching rate uh, actually on on the flavor profile of of the beer. So uh, uh, sometimes cheaper is not always better, uh, uh, but sometimes you know cheaper. So pitching less yeast leads to uh, to something uh, that could be very interesting uh, for you. It's it's all depending on 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 the flavor that you are looking for and the, the specific beer that you are brewing. But I'll show that in two weeks. So Dave also used <coughs> two different yeasts combined for different flavors. Uh, that's possible um obviously but yeah to be honest if you, uh, you you are obviously an experienced brewer um if you want to do that you really have to know uh, uh, quite a lot about the kinetics of of the independent yeast uh, on the same word on the same conditions in the same brewery uh, before you start combining because if you for instance uh uh, uh, use US05, for instance, in combination with uh, with S33. Uh, the S33 grows uh, about five times faster than, uh, or ferments about five times faster than the US05. So if you if you dose them in the same ratio uh, at the start of the fermentation, you will only get the flavors from the S33 because it will dominate uh, the culture very very rapidly. So then the US05 is not doing uh, anything. So if you know the kinetics, you should, uh, uh, you know, pitch way more USO5 compared to S33, so they can really, you know, uh, meet each other later on in the fermentation. So you have a similar amount of cells uh, of each yeast, so a similar contr contribution. But you can play with that for sure. It's nice. It's not only done by brewers; it's also done by distillers. So a lot of distillers these days. You start uh, with uh, with the brewing yeast and then uh, add uh, distilling yeast later. Uh, so that's that's uh, we we very much like that because uh, uh, it's 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 just being creative and uh, and innovative and 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 use uh, uh, the tools that you have to uh, to create the beer that you want. That's a that's a fact. So, Emily, I think now. Uh, there are no more questions anymore. So I think we can close the webinar. I wish everybody a great weekend. Make sure to uh, enjoy some of uh, the good things in life, like beer. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I hope to see you uh, in, in three weeks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.